I'm Christina from Brain Reach North. In our series called Indigenous Individuals in STEM, we talk to five individuals to get their unique perspectives on their careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. In this video, Megan from Brain Reach North talked to Senator Lillian Eva Dick, who grew up in the prairies of Saskatchewan. Senator Dick is a member of the Gordon First Nation and a first generation Chinese Canadian. Senator Dick is also a neuroscientist who completed her PhD at the University of Saskatchewan and worked as a full professor there for many years. She has won numerous awards for her achievements in science. She was appointed to the Senate in 2005 and became the first Indigenous woman and first Chinese Canadian to become a senator. Hello, Senator. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Yeah, no problem, Megan. Great. So I won't keep you for too long. I just wanted to be able to capture your scientific career and your journey and be able to share this message with our audiences. Because um, after reading some recent articles about your work and your life as a scientist, I thought you'd be the perfect person to interview to showcase your story as a First Nations and Chinese Canadian woman in science. So my first question is, would you please tell me a little bit about yourself and where you grew up? Oh, gosh. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I was born in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. We moved around a lot between Saskatchewan and Alberta. My dad, being Chinese, uh, ended up being a restaurant owner. Um, and then later on, he ran different Chinese cafes all across little small towns in the prairies. In the prairie culture, uh, every little town had a Chinese cafe. And we ran quite a few of those. So I went to a lot of different schools, but we were very lucky that we ended up in a little city called Swift Current. And the high school was really good. Um, we were really good teachers, um, really good science teachers, and the chemistry teacher, uh, Mr. John Dyer, was also uh, the vice principal. He took a really active interest in my brother and myself and sort of told us, you know, because we we're good in, in sciences, he, he actually really encouraged us to go to university. So uh, we were very fortunate that we had such good teachers in a good school, and so that kept our interest alive, particularly in the sciences. This goes way back to the early 1960s. It was also the time of space exploration with Sputniks and satellites, so science was really a, a popular item in the news. Certainly. Um, who would you say taught you the most when you were growing up? What did you learn from them? I had attributed to this one particular teacher, Mr. Dyer. Uh, also my biology teacher, Mr. Newland. The biology teacher was really good too. Uh, as I said, we're just very fortunate that we did have such good teachers uh, in pretty much every subject. But the biology and chemistry in particular, I think they were the teachers that were the most influential. Certainly. What made you choose your career in biological psychiatry slash neuropsychiatry? Well, you know, as you as you know, when you when you take classes at university, a lot depends on how well you like the professor, how well you like the labs. My brother wanted me to go into chemistry. I like chemistry, but I found it kind of dry. So I thought I would try biochemistry, and I did get a chance to work in uh, in sort of a horticultural lab in a biochemistry lab when I was an undergrad, so, uh, so they were summer jobs, and I really liked the lab work. I really liked, you know, participating in experiments and, you know, seeing the results and trying to figure out what it meant. So it was the summer, summer jobs that really convinced me, and because they were more biological in nature, I really liked that. Definitely. and. 
How was your experience and cultural identity as a member of the Gordon First Nation and a first generation Chinese Canadian? How did that shape your career path? Well, it didn't really have anything to do with it until much later in my life. Uh, it wasn't until uh, oh, my late 30s that I started to think about what difference that might have made. Uh, so then I then embarked upon a, a study of uh, sort of the so-called allergic reactions to alcohol amongst uh, a small set of Saskatchewan Indians because there, there's this myth that uh, North American Indians are allergic or more sensitive to alcohol. Uh, the literature was very mixed and I thought a lot of the papers that were published were very poor quality. So I did do a short project uh, looking at alcohol metabolizing enzymes amongst a, a group of Saskatchewan Indians versus Saskatchewan Caucasians and one of the um, main differences in alcohol metabolism that's been found is, is in Asians and there's uh, one particular enzyme I try to remember now uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase there's a different form of it in Asians than there is in Caucasians and so I thought that perhaps that same difference might occur should occur in Saskatchewan Indians if they really are allergic and the work that I did showed no the uh, isozyme powder was the same in Saskatchewan Indians and Caucasians there was no difference what was it like winning the National Aboriginal Achievement Award in science in 1999 oh that was a thrill you know because uh that, that's the first time I met another Canadian Indigenous scientist. That was Dr. Malcolm King. Actually, he's now at the University of Saskatchewan. He's a chemist. And he is the only other Indigenous person that I met that had a PhD. There's, there's quite a few more coming up now. But back then, he was the only other one I'd met. I had gone to a conference in Colorado I think in the early 2000s, and I met maybe about a dozen American Indian scientists, but it is few and far between. So you always feel like you're the only one because you pretty much are. Definitely. I feel like a lot of it is just exposure, and luckily you encountered those paths where you could have that exposure and pursue the scientific career that you've had such success in. If I were to do it again, it would be so exciting because in the field of uh, chemistry and medicine, you know, the traditional medicines is uh, such a, oh, an incredibly interesting topic. All the work you could do with that in terms of, you know, the types of medicines that can be used for treating cancer, treating diabetes, you know, maybe even mental health, right? Exactly. So much... So much uh, that can be explored, that hasn't been explored. How would you say that your culture has influenced your work in politics and the causes that you support? Well, it certainly, uh, I think it, it influenced me in a sense that the, the issues that I spent most of my time on really boiled down to violence against Indigenous women. Uh, I spent a lot of my time on the the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. I also advocated a lot on uh, increasing uh, opportunities for education for Aboriginal youth because there's a funding gap. You know, without proper funding of schools and changes in curriculum, Indigenous students could be doing a lot better. Uh, so I spent a lot, a lot of my time on the post-secondary education issues and uh, the issues with respect to Indigenous women. So thank you so much again for speaking with me today. I truly appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule and for your consideration and thoughtful answers. I really appreciate it so much. Well, you're most welcome. Take care. Thank you, Senator Dick, for sharing your insights with us. Check out the Brain Reach North blog for more interviews.